The Haunting of Keir Starmer, Political Hauntology, Ghostly Authentocracy, and Techno-Capitalist Contradictions, by Dr. Tom Sykes of the University of Portsmouth. In both his politics and his semiotics, Labour leader Keir Starmer is haunted by a melange of contradictions. Frequently chastised for dithering inertia when trying to hold the Conservative Party to account, he is nonetheless decisively destroying the left wing of his own party. A consummate establishment figure, metropolitan, Oxford educated, a knight of the realm, a former director of public prosecutions, Starmer likes to organise photo opportunities in pubs and deploy the rhetoric of ostensible working class authenticity. His taking of the knee and other such genuflections to wokeness have been undermined by his tone-deaf comments on anti-black racism and indifference to Islamophobia. Though a devotee of focus groups and opinion tracking, Starmer has repeatedly misjudged the public mood on almost every issue, and the all-important polls prove as much. Such discord finds its corollary in his uncannily portmanteau appearance, which embodies conflicting styles, fashions and physiognomies belonging to several decades of British political and cultural history. In order to comprehend Starmer's weird, clashing and eerie complexities, I want to place them under three critical lenses. Hauntology, coined by Jacques Derrida, but repurposed for other contexts by Mark Fisher, Merlin Coverley and others. Authentocracy, originated by the British cultural theorist Joe Kennedy, and digital age instrumentarian politics, as theorised by primarily Shoshana Zuboff in her book Surveillance Capitalism, and to a lesser extent the cybernetics scholars Anna Verena Nostoff and Felix Maschewski. Technocratic is one of the most common adjectives the popular media has attached to Keir Starmer. Rather than lead by personal conviction or ethical vision, he prefers to follow the hard data to supposedly pragmatic stances. While Dominic Cummings is perhaps the standard bearer for this worldview, Starmer too places great faith in focus groups and statistical modelling. He is also a member of the Trilateral Commission, an elite diplomatic forum that, while often the subject of harebrained conspiracy theories drastically overestimating its power and influence, nonetheless extols a retreat from participatory democracy into centralised managerial state rule. Starmer is thus an appropriate custodian for what Shoshana Zuboff terms instrumentarianism, the world's dominant new mode of governance and social control. It is, she claims, the political superstructure of our current phase of surveillance capitalism, in which algorithms and other digital techniques chart public opinion and consumer tastes in order to generate fabulous corporate wealth, sustain all kinds of labor and occupy hours of leisure time. Deriving from the behaviourist psychology of B.F. Skinner, Zuboff further contends, instrumentarianism rules by amassing totalities of data to predict and alter public behaviour for the aim of creating a fairer, happier and even utopian society. Whereas past political ideologies that were spawned by ruptures in capitalism, such as European totalitarianism in the 1930s, had a moral quasi-religious seal for capturing individual souls and perfecting society along racial or cultural divisions, instrumentarianism's purported scientific neutrality has a radical indifference to moral meaning and value. A far cry from God, nation, king, civilizing mission, master race, or any of the other transcendent purposes that have impelled previous social orders, instrumentarianism's ultimate objective is the automation of market and society for the certainty of guaranteed outcomes. Arguably, the new Labour project birthed the instrumentarian style in British politics. It sacrificed ideological commitment to the jealous, unforgiving God of winning elections. In prostrating itself to the widest possible constituency, New Labour was sure there wasn't such a thing as truth and grew allergic to the past because it reminded it, it of socialism and other grand narratives of change, argued the cultural critic Terry Eagleton in 2001. In some ways, Keir Starmer is a surveillance capitalism age descendant of what Tony Benn witheringly called the weathercock 
archetype of third way politician who hasn't got an opinion until they've looked at the polls, talked to the focus groups, discussed it with the spin doctors. One of instrumentarianism's key flaws is that data sources can, contra can contradict themselves and each other, as illustrated by former Blair apparatchik Derek Draper's anecdote about members of a focus group that simultaneously stated that they wanted to pay lower taxes and that they wanted better funded public services. A more recent example would be voters in the north of England who hold both traditionally right and left wing views as fervent as fervent about repatriating immigrants as they are about renationalizing the railways. Furthermore, public opinion can change abruptly, as developments like Brexit illustrate. If a politician is steered solely by the collated whims, hunches and mixed feelings of the electorate as expressed at any given moment, then it can lead to a spooky absence where values, principles and long term thinking should be. Thus, Starmer has infamously evaded direct questions from interviewers such as, what is your vision? With nebulous talk of listening to the public and facing the country, though he has barely spelled out what actual policies could be extrapolated from these methods. Journalist Aditya Chakraborty has damned this as passing off professionalized caution as wisdom. Starmer therefore seems, at least in his public life, somewhat incapable of independent thought or making normative statements, like one of the uncanny automatons in TV science fictions from humans to Westworld, which are themselves arguably cultural reflections of instrumentarianism's anti-human program of relinquishing individual agency to automated systems, as Zuboff puts it. In lieu of a political program, whether data-driven or not, Starmer has cleaved to a retrograde imaginary about what the British people want. His uninspiring zombie-like speech to the 2020 Labour conference appealed to the misty, ill-defined values that Joe Kennedy would term authentocratic. Starmer's tiresome shtick about security, integrity, the rule of law, and his fumbling with that political bromide par excellence, being the first in my family to go to university, are tenets of, Kennedy argues, a discourse of laundered centrist populism that is an intellectually derelict hangover from a previous political era of neoliberal consensus and tinkering technocracy. That, in addition to these platitudes, Starmer is addicted to the register of novelty. He has said that the party is under new management and his official slogan is a new leadership, betrays an insecurity about the true regressiveness of his project for which he must overcompensate by encanting the word new as often as possible, it seems. Moreover, authentocracy is essentially ambiguous because it makes persistent reference to an authenticity that is always just over there, writes Kennedy. Thus, in his conference speech, hampered by sterile prose and delivered in a setting of hygienic torpor, as Aaron Bastani wryly commented, Starmer made no attempt to elucidate his buzzwords, resulting in a worrying uncertainty about what he really meant when he invoked patriotism, the military and other potentially volatile topics, given the post-Brexit ethno-nationalist climate. The weirdest and most antiquated of his phrases, family values, was surely haunted out of all credibility during the flamboyantly sleazy Tory administration of John Major in the 1990s. Starmer was apparently trying to speak the language of ordinary people, assuming that ordinary people are inherently and uniformly conservative, jingoistic, ethnocentric, and resistant to even a modicum of social democratic reform. But this assumption, Kennedy averse, is one of authentocracy's guiding phantoms that other New Labour leaders, Gordon, British Jobs for British Workers, Brown and Ed, it isn't prejudiced to worry about immigration, Miliband, have tried to chase down to their great cost. Starmer is now learning this the hard way. With the Conservatives' 13-point advantage over Labour in the latest opinion polls, at least partly ascribable to his brand of authentocracy, that precludes him from challenging the government on the most consequential matters from COVID to European free movement to the so-called Spy Cops Bill. The troubling ways in which Starmer's incoherent politics are encoded semiotically into his appearance can be explained by hauntology. According to this critical perspective, contemporary cultural phenomena are assailed or antagonized by aesthetic modes and ideological attitudes that were thought to have been superseded or forgotten. 
In films, books, and other discourses, these ghosts often appear in temporarily hybrid form, merging attributes from different historical moments and inhabiting, as Merlin Coverley puts it in his new book on the subject, a post-nostalgic world in which the present can no longer be experienced as anything other than the sum of its pasts. Thus, Starmer's fealty to passe New Labour technocracy, which some say originated in the 1980s when the party turned to PR consultants and survey companies to make itself electable in the teeth of Thatcherism, accounts for the likening of Starmer's face to Max Headroom by the Mail Online's Richard Littlejohn. But Starmer's flushed, pixelated block recalls other computer-generated characters from the early 80s. Dire Straits' music video Money for Nothing springs to mind. And more contemporary artefacts that knowingly reference the same decade, such as the retro puzzle game Minecraft. Moreover, the sharp suit, sculpted sideburns and vacuous earnest expression are redolent of the 80s yuppie genus, as well as certain 90s and noughties male archetypes from the oleaginous Blairite lawmakers to whom Starmer owes his ideological poses, so far as we can discern any, to the romantic leads of Richard Curtis comedies. It was for a while speculated that Mark Darcy, the barrister character in the Curtis co-written film Bridget Jones's Diary, was based on Starmer, whom the author of the original novel knew at Oxford. Starmer's other features allude to a more radical tradition within the Labour Party, which perhaps helped attract some Corbyn supporters during the leadership election. The side-parted quiff recalls Tony Benn, and Iron Bevan and other icons of the post-war social democratic consensus. And of course, Starmer's first name conspicuously suggests a socialist provenance dating back to the Labour Party's foundation in 1900. These elements of his disjointed motley visual identity seem to have survived the personal journey he made from revolutionary socialism, as a young idealistic human rights lawyer he edited a Trotskyist front magazine, to his current third wave managerialism. Such a journey is perhaps the biggest cliche in the left wing politics playbook. While Starmer's aesthetic conforms to the postmodern palimpsests that are fundamental to hauntological discourse, it also adheres in a subtler way to what Coverley calls hauntology's preoccupation with ghosts and spectres, the eerie and the occult. We are all familiar with the long-standing demonology of politicians regarded as excessively cruel and inhumane. From at least far back as an 1806 cartoon of Napoleon Bonaparte driving a carriage pulled by imps to, in 2005, the Labour campaign poster depicting Michael Howard as a dark pendulum swinging wizard, which rightly drew allegations of anti-Semitism, and, more lately, the spitting image reboots portrayal of Pretty Patel as a vampire. Such dread imagery has also been mobilised against those deemed too far left of the Overton window, from Tony Benn, paradoxically lampooned in the gutter press, as both a new Hitler and a new Messiah figure, to Jeremy Corbyn, constructed as either the devil incarnate, or at the very least, in league with the evil one. Less remarked upon is the rendering of the political centre in demonological terms. After all, historically satirists have found more mileage in the serio-comic ineptitude of its protagonists, whether this be Jeremy Thorpe's slapstick murder plot in the late 70s, or David's steel and Owen piloting the SDP into electoral freefall in the 80s. That said, it was not long ago that the cynicism, corruption and deceit of the new Labour experiment earned its shady controllers epithets like the Prince of Darkness, also anti-Semitic given Mandelson's ethnic heritage, and unflattering comparisons to Batman's cackling sociopathic arch foe. It is in Keir Starmer as political operator and discursive entity that this supernatural facet of hauntology fuses curiously with the discordant elements of pastiche discussed earlier. As Mark Fisher, one of hauntology's main popularizers, writes of the closely connected phenomenon of the weird, the form that is perhaps most appropriate to the weird is montage, the conjoining of two or more things which do not belong together. Like a marionette or caricature with outsized head, Starmer looks ill at ease and out of place and somewhat possessed. This is true of his widely circulated official portrait photograph and in his National Portrait Gallery picture with its scared, spiritless eyes. The former image particularly might be found on the teak panelled walls of a Gothic mansion from an Edgar Allan Poe yarn. 
These more chilling coordinates of Starmer's semiotics remind us that despite its claim to be neutral, objective and utilitarian, the instrumentarianism to which he subscribes is in fact partisan, self-interested and totalitarian, so argue Zuboff and others. Just as so contend Anna Verena Nostoff and Felix Maschewski, the unstoppable forces of digitization are threatening freedom and privacy through mass surveillance and democracy through trolling, shadow banning and dark advertising. Starmer is prosecuting an authoritarian clampdown on leftist Labour MPs and grassroots members. Though his stated mission is to eliminate, eliminate anti-Semitism from the party, this is not motivated by a bean counter's fidelity to the facts. There is a ghostly disjuncture between the moderate insistence that the scourge is institutional to the party and its numerically minor presence in Labour. For in 2018 to 19, just 0.3% of over 500,000 members were facing anti-Semitism charges, according to the findings of Professor Greg Philo and four other scholars. Rather than acknowledging this evidence and acting proportionately towards it, Starmer's purge has grown more irrational, pedantic, vindictive, legally foggy and hypocritical. He sacked his adversary, Rebecca Long Bailey, for foolishly reposting a misguided claim about Israelis training US police. He didn't sack his ally Steve Reed for calling a Jewish businessman a puppet master. There is something then of the calm, gentle, polite Dr. Henry Jekyll about the Starmer who soporifically addresses Boris at the dispatch box. While Starmer the enforcer's conduct towards progressive members of his own party is closer, figuratively speaking of course, to the unnameable violence of Mr. Edward Hyde's nocturnal exploits. As one anonymous Labour frontbencher told The Guardian in June this year, he is ruthless, he will act firmly, if you pick a fight with him, you will lose. When it comes to other embattled minorities, the face of Keir Jekyll re-emerges to offer only spectral silence, such as when he was confronted by a caller on LBC Radio who expounded the hateful Great Replacement calumny. After taking the knee for Black Lives Matter, Starmer dismissed the movement as a moment before then regretting that choice of words. It may be that Starmer's authentocratic delusions are stopping him from taking part in the so-called culture wars for fear of alienating the voters he needs to woo away from the Tories in 2024. Certainly he needs to win back red wall seats lost in 2019. But even if his blithe reproduction of Little England symbology were a viable strategy and recent by-election results suggest otherwise, what would be the particular moral and political price of such a Faustian pact? Already it appears BAME voters are turning away from him and that a majority of Labour's Muslim members do not trust the party to tackle Islamophobia. By way of conclusion to his book, Coverley states that hauntology is the early warning signal that alerts us to the perils of the present by transporting us to a similar moment of crisis in our recent past. The most recent political crisis that Starmer brings to mind is the unravelling of millennial labourism's uneasy dialectic between bland managerial respectability and nasty, sometimes violent opportunism. When the grotesqueries of Iraq, the war on terror, NHS privatisation, venal donors and the like began to choke the air of competence and reliability around youngish polite grinning men in shirts without ties calling as novelist will self put it at the time each other by their first names a similar dialectic is now informing both starmer's form and content and is unlikely to redress contemporary crises crises that are in part frankenstein's monsters of the blair period the Labour Party's internal standoff between rightist administrators and rank and file leftist members, myriad varieties of inequality, the putrefaction of public services, the UK's complicity in capital driven neo imperialism, and suffice to say, the excesses of surveillance capitalism. Given that even some of Starmer's centrist colleagues are now disturbed by his diabolical polling, could his desire to please almost everyone end up pleasing no one? And he, like the Joker, the Prince of Darkness, and others before him, is soon consigned to the graveyard of political history.